name is Richard Roger. I'm the CEO of uh, VoxGig, a uh, startup that's using microservices. Um, we used microservices from day one, from the very start of the system. Um, and this talk is kind of a, a, a history lesson, the lessons learned about what happens if you, if you take that approach. Um, it's pretty good, it's not all good. Um, so we learned some interesting lessons on the way. Um, but it, it did work, uh, and it has worked out pretty well. Um, so the reason we're using microservices from day one is because I said you should use microservices from day one. Um, I used to run a, an IT consultancy, and we did a whole bunch of digital transformation projects. Um, we started specializing in Node.js. And so put your hands up if you've built uh, like large JavaScript applications at all. Yeah, uh, how much fun was it? <laughs> no fun at all, right? Uh, so the reason I ended up doing microservices is because JavaScript, the language, doesn't scale. Uh, it doesn't have enough internal structure that you get in other languages uh, like uh, Java or C Sharp. Um, and it just leads to really messy code. Uh, so an easy way to avoid that problem is just to split the code base into lots of little pieces. Uh, so Node.js kind of pushed us into microservices, um, and I ended up doing a whole bunch of digital transformation projects for uh, companies at various sizes, and after having gone through all those experiences, uh, wrote a book about it. Uh, and the whole point of the book was to promote the consulting company, which I subsequently left to do a startup. Uh, but unfortunately, I sort of put my name in public to the idea that you have to do microservices from day one and that it was a good idea. Uh, and I'd been pitching that to my consulting clients, so I kind of had to do it myself uh, when it was my own company on the line. It is a good idea. It definitely works. Um, it's definitely a way to manage a lot of the complexity in, in uh, startups. Uh, but the startup world is a little bit different, and this talk is, is, uh, goes into some of those differences and what, you, what ends up happening when you use microservices uh, from day one. Um, so what we're building is a business-to-business -business software as a service platform. It's for uh, companies that exhibit at events. Um, so uh, for example, uh, HBC here might go to an event and have a stand and have people speaking and they're looking to recruit developers, that sort of thing. Um, but there's a marketing team that manages that activity where they decide who's going to exhibit. Um, so it's a multi-tenant system where you have hundreds of different companies and they all have different teams and you have different people going to different events. There's a whole bunch of permissions and a whole bunch of different uh, functions, budgeting, travel planning, um, calendar integrations, integrations with CRM, all that sort of stuff. So lots of fun enterprise stuff. So you can see there's lots and lots of different parts of the application, lots and lots of different interface, interfaces, different people see different things. Um, I'm just sticking up a load of screenshots just to give you an idea of the scale of the application. So it's one of those enterprise applications where if you try to build everything uh, as one monolith, uh, you're going to end up with tons and tons of coupling and tons and tons of dependencies, and you're going to run into massive amounts of technical debt. So it is a natural case for microservices because you can split up the development into lots of little pieces. Uh, I had an interesting discussion uh, earlier with, with uh, one of the attendees about uh, you know, breaking large teams down into, or l large development groups down into different teams and then the teams together form tribes and that sort of stuff and you run it through an agile process. Um, but in a way, uh, when you're building a startup especially, you don't have the luxury of that amount of structure. Often you're building stuff with um, junior developers who might be only there for a summer or contract developers in a different country. You might have somebody who's on board for a little while but then gets a better job offer or moves somewhere else. You might be, uh, as a CEO, doing a bit of coding yourself and being a really bad coder because coding in the morning and trying to do sales calls in the afternoon is a recipe for really bad code. Uh, but nonetheless, you end up having to do it. So. Uh, it's very easy to end up with really bad structure and tons of technical debt and microservices is a way to build lots and lots of stuff like this pretty quickly without tripping up all over yourself and ending up uh, in, such, in such trouble. So the question is how do you structure 
the code base to help you. It's not a, it's not a problem of how do you structure the process. Uh, how you run the team is not a luxury that you have in a startup. Um, but I think this is applicable if you're working in a larger organization as well. The process, whether it's Scrum or different flavors of Agile, even Waterfall, is only part of the problem. If the architectural structure of the system doesn't support the uh, goals of the team and the amount of requirements coming in from the business side, uh, no amount of Kanban boards or whatever is going to save you. Uh, so this is one of my fundamental beliefs is that the inherent architecture of the system should make it easy to manage and contain technical debt and handle changing requirements. Uh, and it's especially brutal in a startup. But it also applies to larger enterprise teams. Uh, so this is the history of the project so far. It's been going for about 15 months of development. Um, the first three months was just kind of exploring, building a bunch of stuff, um, trying out different new technologies. I wish we tried out serverless. We didn't at the time. We were doing other stuff. Uh, we're starting to use a bit of serverless now. Um, we built an MVP over about three months with a small team and outsourced half some of those development uh, we then got a bunch of, of clients that we were working with uh, through private trials and we were basically building against their requirements almost as if it was a consulting project. And then in the last three months, we we're kind of building out the system to do a public launch. Uh, so each of these phases had different requirements and different forces. Uh, but the microservice approach has definitely helped us navigate these different phases of the project. Just to give you an idea of the, the sort of technology background, like I said, I wish serverless was in there. It's not quite yet. Um, Vue.js front-end, um, Happy and Seneca, which are node libraries uh, on the back-end. Um, we're using MongoDB, but are going to migrate eventually to Postgres. The reason we're using Mongo is because we need to have flexibility on the schemas, and then when the schemas eventually solidify and stabilize, then we move it over to Postgres, because Postgres is ultimately better uh, in production. Uh, we ended up using... Uh, a really interesting search engine called Vespa.ai, which is kind of like Elasticsearch, but uh, it also does um, tensor-based queries, so it can do recommendations, that sort of thing. Recommendations were an important part of our uh, feature set. Uh, Vespa is actually it's a 15-year-old code base that Yahoo has maintained over time. They open-sourced it last year, and it runs the search of Yahoo Finance. Um, and it's really cool because if you... Uh, if you want to use machine learning in your system, but it needs to operate really quickly in real time, Vespa provides that solution because you can, you can calculate, you can pre-calculate tensors using TensorFlow and then upload them into Vespa and it'll run them in a really, really efficient way. And then we're running on uh, Kubernetes on Google Cloud. We chose Google Cloud because at the time it was the only one that had been uh, at production grade for a while. Now, obviously, we have a choice of Azure or AWS which we're evaluating at the moment, actually. So you can see it is very heavily skewed towards JavaScript. That's necessarily because that's been my background for the last couple of years. OK, so the, the problem we have in terms of building the system is how do we enable emergent design? Um, and I'm using this phrase, emergent design, because we didn't know what the requirements were ourselves. Uh, we built an MVP. We got reactions to that. Then we went to trial clients. And they had a whole bunch of different requirements. Um, and then we went to VCs, and they had a whole bunch of different opinions. So the requirements are changing uh, loads really rapidly. How do you handle all that? And how do you make sure that you don't end up with tons of technical debt? And I think the approach you have to take is a really, really uh, obsessive component-based approach to software development. Uh, so these are all combinations of uh, all the ways you can combine a 2 by 4 Lego block. Um, and the, the idea is that the software that you build, the microservices have to be able to fit together in this pattern as well. Um, so over the years, having built a bunch of microservice systems, uh, there are two principles that I like to apply. One is transport independence. So it shouldn't matter if you're using HTTP or RabbitMQ or Kafka or whatever way that your microservices talk to each other. Uh, that should be irrelevant to the implementation. Um, but you can actually kind of take that all the way and say microservices shouldn't know about each other. So the model of the world you want is not the one on the left where microservice A sends a message to microservice B 
and A knows about B. The identity of B is somehow embedded in A. Um, that's a coupling, right? So that's, that was a classic software architecture diagram, right? Two boxes and narrow connecting them. Uh, is A calling a method on B? Is it a HTTP request with a specific network address? Is it a topic on a Kafka bus? It doesn't really matter. There's, a, there's an idea of identity in there, which creates coupling. So instead, you should have this view of the world that a uh, microservice receives messages and sends messages, and it doesn't know from whom they came or to whom they went. Now, that's a little piece of illusion. It's for the developers. It's for the, the developers building the business logic. Of course, underneath it all, you wire this together in various ways. You might use a service mesh, or you might have a, you might have a, a really simple internal library that actually has the network addresses. But from the perspective of the code, it looks like you operate in this um, void as a microservice. It's just messages in and out. This means that you can build uh, a ton of different structures, and it's one half of the component model. What this gives you is the second piece, which is pattern matching. Um, so I'm using uh, suits of cars to kind of demonstrate the idea. Uh, so the idea is that the B service does something looks at all the network, it looks at all the messages streaming through the network. And again, we just assume it's looking at all the messages. To implement this efficiently, you wouldn't do it this way. But it's looking at the universe of messages and any of them that are the heart suit, it grabs and acts on them in some way. So if microservice A sends out a message, which is the king of hearts, B eventually acts on it. And this is a conceptual model which lets you do a couple of things. Um, so in the top left-hand corner, you can see it really easily, it allows you to scale really easily because you can just add more Bs. Um, and that gives, you a, that gives you kind of a broadcast model just for free. Um, if you look at the uh, bottom left, you get a model where you have like an actor pattern where you, you, you can have B and C and D and they all do different things. Again, A doesn't know about that. It doesn't know it needs to send messages to different places. You don't need to wire different topics in uh, a, a RabbitMQ bus or any of that sort of stuff. Uh, and then in the top right, you have um, a really interesting model where uh, you can create special cases quite easily. So one of the ways that uh, we approach microservice development is to build microservices that handle the general case, the sort of 90% of requests. And then you might have edge cases, like a special client requirement or some special case that you need to handle. Instead of putting if statements or extending your data logic or your schemas, or, or instead of creating complexity and technical debt inside the main microservice, you just add a new one, and that new one contains the complexity. And it handles the special cases. And you use pattern matching to say, okay, in the cases where the ace of hearts goes out, that's got weird logic. We just write a whole new microservice and deal with that. And that's a really, really effective way of dealing with technical debt because you don't you don't create complexity in existing code. You just leave it alone. The objective is actually to deploy a microservice and then never change it again. Of course, that doesn't happen in practice, but that's the idea. And then finally, uh, in the bottom right corner, you have composition, which is really uh, probably the most powerful piece of this architecture where uh, originally I had A sending messages that end up at B, but now I've uh, put C in the middle and C adds caching or a permissions layer or modifies the message in some way or sends it to a different place or translates it. Again, I leave B alone and I have some other type of thing that I want to add in like permissions and I add another microservice that intercepts, intercepts messages between A and B and adds that extra functionality. Uh, and that means you compose the microservices together kind of like Lego bricks, which is the whole point. Okay, so the architecture that we ended up using for the system, um, because we have all these different use cases, we have organizers of events, we have people who exhibit at events, we have speakers, we have attendees, they all have their own uh, set of little apps that they use, right? So a speaker might have an app that lets them plan where they're gonna talk, or they might have an app that lets them plan their travel. Uh, so we broke our system from a UX perspective apart into all these little apps. Um, which led to a, a fairly obvious architecture where you have uh, code on the client side, which is the UX code in the browser or, or mobile device. Uh, 
talking to uh, an internal app, which is a microservice that provides business logic specific to that case, uh, planning a talk, for example. And then you have a core service which might handle um, logic to do with uh, tasks. So in our system, you have checklists and you have mini projects and you have dependencies between different things. You're planning to exhibit at a, a talk, you need to make sure that the t-shirt delivery is going to arrive. Um, so one of the nice things you can do with tasks is you can do a topological sort. So you can kind of sort the tasks based on their dependencies to tell you what task you're doing next. So a task service handles that deep internal complexity. And then you have the data which intercepts uh, calls to Mongo or Postgres or whatever. So you can see that I'm not worried about moving from Mongo to Postgres because all of my data access is mediated by microservices. So it's irrelevant what the database is. Uh, so this is the desired architecture, but this is not what happens in practice because we're trying to allow ourselves the flexibility to deal with um, random requirements and emergent design. We're onboarding junior developers. What actually happens in practice is this, which is much messier. So there's a whole bunch of stuff on the client. If you can write Vue.js code, go for it. Just throw it out there. It doesn't matter what it does. Um, all the business logic ends up in the app at first, because we don't know what the requirements are going to be really. So there's a whole bunch of complex tech, technical debt laden code in the app. There's no core services because it's not clear what they should be first. And then there's the data piece, which is moderately stable. So the whole idea is uh, try to respond to the clients as quickly as possible by making really messy code and a messy architecture first and only later moving to the desired state. Typically what this involves is extracting the business logic out of that app and turning it into a core service and then identifying uh, species of apps and turning them into uh, effectively app templates, which is a process we're going through at the moment. Um, this works re relatively well and because we follow transport independence, and pattern matching, it's not a painful process. It's a relatively easy refactoring because we're not refactoring code, we're refactoring message flows. And typically it's not the case that we re refactor the app. We actually create two new microservices, a cleaner app and a core service and we throw the old complex technical debt laden app away. Uh, so this this gives us a migration path to sanity. And we've done this a couple of times. So having followed that approach, um, and having done that over 15 months of development through various constraints, uh, it lets us stand back and take a look at the microservices that we have in production and kind of see where we ended up in terms of size and all that sort of stuff. So we have 65 Node.js services. Uh, we decided to experiment with polyglot services at the start. Um, we had a couple of Python ones and one Erlang one. This is a really bad idea. <laughs> Microservices, you, you know, some of the advocates say, great, you can build polyglot services. That's really fun until your Erlang developer decides to go and get a proper job. And you're left with, <laughs> I mean, well, it was actually written in Elixir. Uh, I hear it's really cool. I took one look at the code and I studied Prolog in, in college. So I, but no, just like delete, rewrite it in Node. Um, you know, if you're using Java, use Spring Boot. Um, I think the, the supposed advantages of Polyglot are nowhere near the disadvantages in, in terms of the lack of team cohesion and all of the extra difficulties that you get from trying to write services in different languages. You still have an exit valve in that if you really need to write something in a different language, you can. Um, but I wouldn't plan to do it. It just doesn't give you that many advantages. This one is interesting. This is a chart showing the number of services versus the size. So you can see it's following a power law. Most of the services are small, right? So um, there's eight ser or six services that are just 100 lines of code, for example. And there's one behemoth on the other side, which is uh, 9,400 lines of code, right? So that was one of the really early services that we wrote. It's got tons and tons of technical debt. Uh, all of the business logic is still stuck inside that service and hasn't been extracted. So these, th these charts that I'm showing you are not, these are all production services. These retired services aren't featured here at all. This is as of last week, what was running. Um, but you can see that just following that approach, you do end up with this natural power law where most services are small. And that's where you want to be because it means most of them are disposable. 
if you've used the wrong data schema for something or uh, the, the approach is incorrect or there's technical debt in the service, you can just rewrite it and delete the old code. Um, it's really interesting persuading the team to do that. Um, developers like their code. They don't like to throw away. They like to refactor. But one of the benefits of microservices is delete and rewrite. Um, and it gives you a way to do that without spending three months rewriting everything. The age of the services is something that surprised me. So what this chart is showing is um, the age in weeks at the bottom and then the number of services. So uh, if you think of it as uh, time going from right to left. So the really old services um, at the sort of 70, 72 week level are the initial set of services that we built, most of which survived and they're still in the system. And they've undergone internal refactoring as well. And then there was a, a, a relatively slow development period where we were experimenting with different things. Um, we then went through a period where we started bringing on board trial clients and getting feedback. So you can see there's a, another development spike. We then go through a period of me doing fundraising, so there was less development work. Um, and then I get the money in, and you can see the development work has started picking up again. Um, I think the interesting thing is that this shows a quite direct correlation between team size and code output, because you're using the microservices as a unit of work. Um, lines of code is not a good unit of work, um, but a, a microservice is a rough, uh, uniform estimator of work. And then code coverage is another place where we have done something interesting. So instead of having a coverage standard for the whole project, uh, what we said was the core services need to be 80 or 90% coverage in terms of unit testing. Um, and we didn't really care about anything else, you know, do what you can. So as a result, you can see that there's a few core services that are like 100%, 90% coverage so we know that our core logic works really, really well. Um, but then there's a whole bunch of stuff, especially old services and uh, user interface, user-facing apps that have really low coverage. Now, most of them are, are uh, they're user-facing apps, so you can kind of tell if they're broken straight away. But nonetheless, this has allowed us to allocate scarce resources efficiently. Um, you're always short of resources in a development team. Um, having a uniform level of, of QA, uniform level of coverage, isn't actually a good idea. Some parts of the system are much more critical than others. That's where you should put most of your unit testing effort. Again, with the microservices as components model, you can say this group should have much higher quality than that group. And you can make that decision explicitly. Uh, that's really, really useful. So in terms of the messages between the services, we ended up with um, 338 message patterns, effectively 338 different types of message. Um, 41 domains, if you've done domain-driven development, or read about it, uh, these aren't proper domains, but you could kind of call them that. Um, and 23, uh, well, tables, but uh, Mongo document stores. Um, so the system, if you want to think about the design of the system, is actually expressed more clearly by these messages than it is by the list of services. Um, and in a way, we can allocate messages to any service we like. That's, that's what refactoring by microservice means. But obviously, uh, while good stuff happened, there was also a bunch of pain along the way. Um, so this kind of covers stuff that worked and stuff that didn't. Uh, one of the things that microservices did not help with at all, uh, who knows what this is, by the way? Anybody come across this? Um, you guys are far too, far too uh, deep into infrastructure and back-end coding. This is the uh, UX double diamond. Um, I only recently found out about this. Um, so this is the approach that a professional UX uh, designer will take to figuring out how a system should inter interact with, with humans. Um, and the idea is you start off uh, where you, you don't know what you're doing, so you kind of diverge in terms of understanding the problem space. You then converge in terms of expressing it and taking it back to the client to validate what you're doing. You then take it to the dev team, which is the second diamond. You diverge again in terms of getting the dev team to come up with an approach that's going to work. Uh, and then you converge on an actual solution. Um, so you now are uh, UX professionals. You can talk, you could bluff your way around a uh, UX uh, any day of the week now. I wish I'd known about this. Um, 
We are actually trying to use microservices on the front end as well. So we ported the microservice uh, library to the front end. Um, it doesn't help half as much as it does on the back end. Even though it, you, can, you have the same uh, forces in terms of structuring the code and being able to unit test and all that sort of stuff, user interfaces are really, really hard. They're super complex code. Two thirds of our code base is in the front end. Um, it's just a really, really hard problem space. Um, I didn't appreciate how difficult it would be. I hadn't done user interface coding in quite a few years. Um, if we'd followed a more structured approach, and if we hadn't tried to impose microservices on the front end, I think we would have done better. Um, this is our biggest bit of refactoring, and we're slowly working our way out of a relatively big mess. Uh, so microservices, not much help on the front end, I'm afraid. Um, the other thing is, if you come up with a good development model, you should kind of follow it. Um, one of the things that I learned from all those projects that I did in the previous company and that I wrote in my book was to follow this process where you try to understand requirements, you express them as messages, and only afterwards do you decide what services you're going to build. Um, the, the idea of microservices as components, transport independence and pattern matching gives you the ability to assign messages to different services and move them around and do nice microservice-based refactoring. And it works really well if you follow this approach, but we didn't. Um, we kind of just jumped in and started building services and uh, ended up with you know, services that are like 9,000 lines of code, right? instead of doing things in a slightly more sensible way. Um, so I kind of go back to the advice that I wrote in my book. This actually works. It's something that you should follow. And if you don't follow it, you do end up with more mess. Um, so this is, what we should, this is what we should have done at the start. So we built um, all of the different types of services to begin with to build an MVP. We built user interface services to try to get a, a, as quickly as possible, get to the point of a system that you could log in and see stuff happening. That was a mistake. What we should have done is taken an extra month to build the back end first. In the sense that if we understood the requirements at a certain level, we could describe them as messages. We could then build core services. We could unit test using the messages so that if you'd end up with a system where you could get all the functionality if you were prepared to type it in at the terminal, effectively, without a user interface. And that would have validated a whole bunch of core stuff for us. So if we'd spent just an extra month uh, maybe taking this approach, it would have saved us a bunch of pain down the road. Um, so I would say if you're building a microservice system, understanding the basic message flows and building that core out first, especially even in a greenfield project, um, will pay dividends down the road. Um, the other thing we found was that uh, if you're going to be idealistic about microservices and try to run every single one uh, in its own Kubernetes pod, then that spike happens. It's super expensive. Um, so we ended up in a situation where and this is where serverless probably would have saved us money as well. We ended up in a situation where we had to bundle services together uh, into single processes and single pods. And the fact that we had this transport independence really saved our lives here because it was easy to turn, it was easy to take services that were individual processes and turn them into single processes. Um, that, also, that actually also helps us on development because when we're running the system locally, we don't run a ton of different processes. It's actually all just the one process and all the services are bundled into that process. Um, but yeah, if you, if you follow this, if you follow microservices as an ideology, you end up in trouble. I had a client uh, in the previous company that ended up in a situation where every individual developer had to have their own uh, large AWS instance to run the system because the system couldn't run on a laptop. So you were developing your own little services, but you needed a, a huge big server to actually run the rest of the system to even develop. Um, so you have to be careful taking anything to, ex to extremes. Um, the other thing that worked really, really well, and this goes back to this idea of messages first uh, and did help us, is the idea that um, if you're building a microservice system and it's all about messages, then you should be able to send a message into the system and get stuff done. This goes back to that, what I was saying earlier about building out the core a little bit first. So for example, we have complex enterprise permissions, right? We have organizations and groups and users 
and different groups can do different things and have access to different parts of the data, all that sort of stuff. Um, and there's access control lists and all that, all that fun kind of permissions that you need to set up for an organization at the enterprise level. But we haven't had to build a user interface for that because we can control and specify that for our clients. Now, it's still manual that we do it, but we can control and specify that for our clients just by sending messages, which are just JSON documents, into the system to get stuff done. And we can validate all of the functionality of the system just by sending messages. In fact, if you look at our unit tests, they're mostly just uh, validating message flows. So this is super powerful. Right? I can log into the system right now and uh, add a new user to an organization, add a new client, test out something that I've just deployed. Um, if there was one piece of advice out of this whole talk that I'd really encourage you to think about is to have uh, some way to interface directly with the live system just by SSHing or telnetting into something. Uh, this is super, super powerful. The other thing that we do now, which I wish we'd done earlier, is to use the natural component model of our uh, programming environment. So in the case of Node, it's NPM modules. So what we do now is every single microservice is also an NPM module. And we have a private account on NPM. Now, you may not be able to do this in enterprise context. You, you probably have to run your own private server. Uh, we can get away with it as a startup. Uh, but we publish every microservice as a private NPM module onto NPM, which means that we get semantic versioning for free. We get um, the ability to, to really easily have different branches, all that sort of stuff. Um, getting yourself set up to run the system is super, super easy because you just do an NPM install or a yarn install or whatever. Um, and it gives us a really, really great way to control all the different services and all the different versions. Um, super, super useful. So if you think about um, other programming platforms or other uh, component registries, um, I really advise you to take a look at that as a solution for artifact management. Uh, because if you can rely on the um, native programming platform component model, if those components express microservices, um, it makes life a lot easier because now you're not operating in two different domains. Um, wish we'd done this sooner. This is super, super useful. Um, and then just going right back to the idea of refactoring using microservices. I, I discuss in the book um, some of the patterns that you use in terms of uh, running those types of deployments where you have to run um, different versions of a service and you deploy them in stages so that you get zero downtime. Uh, we do this really, really effectively. So even though we have tons of technical debt in some services, um, and even though the services are constantly changing, right? we're redeploying multiple times a day, because it's easy for us to say, this message that was going to this service now goes to this service, and to do that in a staged deployment way with zero downtime gives us a ton of flexibility. Um, a good example was we had a core service that handled users. And that was really that was written in the really early days. It's got tons of bad logic. It doesn't handle permissions. Uh, and then we wrote a new service for organizations. And that organization service contains some of the extra logic around groups and permissions. So when you log in, you need to get a description of the user. That was originally in the user service. But we rewrote it and put it in the organization service and then just rerouted the messages. So there was a period of time, half a day, where both of those services were responding. The client services were still using the, uh, the old minimal uh, response object from the user service. But once we'd made that change and the organization service was now able to supply more data, we could upgrade the, the client services as well with zero downtime. Um, so you just have to effectively, it's, configura it's configuration as code. You effectively just script a bunch of um, version deployments um, I, can't, I go into it in, in the book if you want to see exactly the details of doing it. But it works really, really well and it is a sort of payoff for doing things this way. You get this nice flexibility. And you get to, of course, uh, revoke your deployments as well, right? If something goes wrong, it's really, really easy to just roll back. So the other, the other thing is um, how you handle data. Uh, and again, some of the microservice zealots, some of the ideology says you should have a database per microservice. That's sort of unnecessary. 
Um, it doesn't really matter if you have, like we do, eight-ish core services and they're all talking to the same MongoDB cloud instance. Mostly they're using different tables. At most, they're reading from the same table. Um, it really doesn't make a huge difference. Maybe down the road in uh, certain cases where we want to store all data in memory or we want to use Cassandra for some heavy scaling work, um, it'll be easy because we have microservices that mediate the data. Um, but in general, uh, you're just adding a ton of complexity by trying to have a separate database per microservice. It's just completely unnecessary. Um, the other thing we found, um, I, I don't know whether we're unusual in this uh, case, but most of our messages are synchronous request response. Now, that's hidden by the, the transport independence layer. This, the system doesn't really, you don't really see that as a developer, but in reality, we're mostly responding to user interactions. So the request response synchronous model is the one that mostly works for us. Um, if you try to do things in a sort of extreme asynchronous way, you actually end up with two messages effectively for every synchronous message and things become a bit more complicated. Um, so for us, request response seems to work pretty much across the board. I guess the final lesson out of all this is um, to stop thinking about microservices as a deployment model or a way to structure teams or a fancy new architecture um, or anything like that. Go back to basics, right? Go back to thinking about, I'm building a software system and I want to build it out of composable components. Uh, it just so happens that I'm I can deploy them as separate components um, or together. It just so happens that I'm using something called the microservices architecture. But at the end of the day, software development is all about finding a working component model. And this, this is a desire that goes all the way back to Lisp in the 50s and Corba a couple of years ago and you know, Java Beans and all of the different things and iterations and evolutions of that idea. The thing I like about microservices is they, they've separated the idea of components from the language platform. And all of these ideas that I've spoken about here, you can do them in any language. Um, you really should do them in JavaScript because it's such a terrible language and leads to such a big mess. Um, but they're applicable whatever the language platform you're using is. Uh, apart from Clojure, where I, I think Clojure has a different way of working that's uh, quite a bit better, uh, but it's all in one process. Um, you end up in a place where software development is something that makes you happy, like this, which is kind of my favorite software development picture of all time. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>